All right, welcome to lesson 11, uh, and this one is called Intro to Macroeconomics. Now, this is really our first class in macroeconomics. Uh, in fact, the first two modules that we've done have really all been about sort of an introduction to general economics. Whether you would have taken micro or macroeconomics first, you probably would have taken the first two modules. So, um, in fact, by the way, if you are taking microeconomics, you are going to need to know all those things from uh, those first two modules as well. So they're sort of doubly important. But today we're really going to begin this course, which is macroeconomics. And remember what macroeconomics is all about. It's about taking a big picture view of the economy. We're not going to look at individual uh, people or individual businesses, but we're going to look at the economy as a whole. And to do that, we're going to employ something called a model. Now, models, folks, are very, very simple. Uh, if you think of any sort of model that you can imagine in the world, what's the purpose of a model? The purpose of a model is ultimately to make a, a complex idea as easy to understand as possible, to take something that's sort of abstract and make it concrete, make it easy to understand. Okay. The first model we're going to use is what's called the business cycle. And the type of model that it is, is a model that we're going to use all the time this year in economics. And it is a graph, um, specifically a line graph. And, and a lot of people might not think of graphs as models, but remember what graphs do. Graphs takes lots of complicated data and try to put it in a picture that we can easily understand. All right, so we're going to start with just some graphing terminology, which I think hopefully most folks remember. But if not, we'll go over it. Um, Remember that uh, a line graph has two axes. This is right here called the x-axis, and this right here is called the y-axis. And the idea of a line graph is that we're going to compare these two variables. In this case, we're going to compare how things go over time versus economic growth. Now, we don't exactly know what economic growth is yet, and in fact, it's one of the last units we do in this class. But for the moment, let's just assume that economic growth, uh, another way of saying this might be economic uh, goodness. Th things generally are going well when we have economic growth. Um, that's not a very precise definition at all, uh, and hopefully no economist um, would be insulted by that. But for our purposes right now, that's a good way to get us started, I think. Okay. We're going to look at something called the business cycle. And what the business cycle does is it shows how our economy is growing over time. And I think you're going to see something pretty striking. Here's what the business cycle looks like. It looks like a, a, a slinky gone wild, right? OK. It is actually very true that the business cycle seems to have these ups and down. Now, again, what is the business cycle measuring? It's measuring how our economy is growing over time. But again, you can see here very clearly there are some ups and downs. Ups and downs, ups. And that would continue on. It's not a big surprise that the business cycle um, has these ups and downs, and I think you'll see why in just a couple minutes. First, I want to start with some terminology, just to get us all on the same page. Our first term is going to be the word expansion. Okay, In economics, any time that the economy is growing, we call it an expansionary period. And that would be these sections right here. Conversely, anytime the economy is shrinking, we call it a contraction or a contractionary period. And you can see those sections right here. As time is moving forward, we're actually decreasing in the size of our economy. Now, by the way, just a couple other terms. When we're at the highest points of the business cycle, we call those peaks and we're at the lowest points of the business cycle, we call them troughs. And what you're going to notice is, and we're going to see some real life data in just a second, you're going to notice again that it seems to be that this thing goes up and down, up and down in a pretty regular fashion. Um, that's not a big surprise. Now you will notice it is actually sort of sliding upwards overall. If I was to draw a line through the middle of it, you could see it is sort of growing overall. And that tends to be true, and we'll talk about why that is um, as the course moves on. But for right now, we just want to notice that it seems to have these continuous ups and downs. A and to show you that's really true, let's take a look at a real-life example. The best data I can think of to look at this is what's called the unemployment rate. Now, we don't exactly know what that is exactly, but essentially it's, in short terms, the percentage of Americans who want a job who can't find one. Um, and this is actually the opposite of the business cycle, because generally when unemployment is high, economic growth tends to be low. And 
when unemployment is very low, we tend to be having strong economic growth. You don't really need to necessarily know that. All I really want you to see here is the fact that this cycle seems to exist. This is uh, the unemployment rate since 1945, so since World War II. And you can see very clearly, this thing goes up and down and up and down and up and down with a pretty good amount of, irregul uh, of regularity. What's interesting when you think about it is we often think of our politicians and our, our Congress, our president, and we give them a lot of credit and a lot of blame for how the economy is doing. When you see this picture, it sort of humbles you. It sort of makes you realize that maybe they don't have nearly as much responsibility or blame for the economy uh, as we tend to give them because it seems that the economy in very, very broad terms is doing what it wants. Uh, it's doing this business cycle thing. Now we'll get to in a minute why we think this happens. Really guys though, our goal for this semester is not going to be to eliminate this cycle. There's no way to really do that. What we are going to try to do is make it so that we don't have really high peaks and really low troughs. And that might sound strange. You might say, well, why wouldn't we want really high peaks? Well, we'll talk about why. But our goal, let's just say, is going to be to make this business cycle as flat as possible but realistically knowing that we can't exactly eliminate it. Okay, one last thought on the business cycle. Why does it act this way exactly? Well, the, the exact truth is the economy is so massive and large that we don't exactly know. Uh, we're not sure. There's lots of uh, competing theories on this. Uh, one of them, essentially, is that one of those theories is this. The idea that people take more risks when the economy is good and are more careful when the economy is not good. That's a difficult thing to say for sure. It's sort of a guess, but if you think about it, when the economy is going really well, people are willing to take big chances with their money. And when they take big chances with their money, invest in kind of out there businesses. Um, I remember during the late 90s, a lot of people were investing in crazy sounding websites because there was just money flowing everywhere. Well, inevitably, what's going to happen is some of that's going to begin to crash. Um, we know that during the early 2000s, when the economy was going very well, an awful lot of people spent crazy amounts of money on housing. Well, eventually, that's bound to not work out. When people take giant risks, some of it's going to go bad. And so maybe that's what drags down the economy. And then as we get down into the troughs, people start to take measured, more responsible steps with their money, and it starts to grow back up. That's one theory. We don't exactly know for sure, but there's a lot of different competing theories. All we know for certain right now, or at least as far as our course is concerned, is that the business cycle exists. That we, when we reach a certain point, we're going to come down. And then we get to a certain bottom point, we're going to find our way back up. How high we get, how low we get, and how long it takes to come out is really the question. And that, again, just a reminder of this idea, our goal really is to just lessen the extremes. Okay, our second very important model is what's called the circular flow model. Now, sometimes people ask me, how is it possible that econo the economy keeps on going over and over and over and over again? How come it is that when someone buys something that that's not just sort of the end of the line? Well, one of the things we know is that in an economy, all of our money, all of our resources needs to keep moving. It needs to keep circulating in order to keep our economy going. So just as we have the business cycle that shows the overall picture, we use a second model, this thing called the circular flow model, to show how money and goods and services and resources all flow through our economy. Let's take a look at how this actually works. Okay, the first thing is we know that there are essentially two types of markets in an economy. The first type is what's called a factor market. We sometimes call it a resource market. But a factor market is essentially where all the factors of production, or we use the word resources, are sold. Remember what those were, land, labor, and capital. The other market that we have is what's called the product market. And the product market is the market that we might be more familiar with. It's the market where we go and buy and sell goods and services. Okay, so all of our transactions take place in one of these two markets, either the factor market where we sell resources that go into making goods, or the product market, which is up here, the product market for goods and services, where we sell goods and services. 
Okay, now there are two players in the economy. There's actually more, but for right now, let's keep it simple. The first one is what's called a household. Now, the exact definition of a household essentially is people who buy and consume goods and services or who own and sell our resources or our factors of production. Most of the time we think of our households as being just what they sound like, individual people or families. Not always, but most of the time. We also have firms. That's our other player in the economy. Firms essentially are the ones that we think what they sound like, businesses, businesses that produce things. They produce goods and services for households to buy. Okay, so now what we have to see is that our two players, households and firms, have to interact together in the resource or factor market and in the product market as well. Now, some of this should seem intuitive, but I think once we start to see how things work, it'll be a little easier. So let's start off. Okay, how do firms and households interact in the product market? Well, generally speaking, what happens? Firms make goods and services. They produce them. And then what do households do? Households buy them. That's what, just what you would think, right? We produce goods and services, the firms do, and then households, individuals, and families buy those goods and services. Good so far. Okay. Households then have their job too. Households have to provide something. Households provide the resources. Remember those three resources from earlier on? Land, labor, and capital. And in particular, I think the easiest one to think about is labor. What do households do at the beginning of most days? Someone in the household, or possibly more than someone in the household, gets up and goes to work. They provide labor. And who are they providing that labor to? They're providing it to firms. And what do firms do with that labor? They buy it in the factor market, usually through giving someone a salary. They buy that labor and they use it to produce goods. It becomes a factor in producing their goods. So again, let's go through the whole thing. Firms produce goods and services, which they sell in the product market, and then households buy. Households then sell their labor through the factor market, which is bought by firms to be used in producing goods. Pretty simple. And of course, what has to go the opposite way? Well, if all of this stuff is going one way, what goes in the other way in exchange? Well, money. So take a look at the green line. What happens? Companies get money in the product market called revenue when they sell goods. They then use that money to hire workers to buy labor in the form of a wage or a salary. That money then goes back to the households as income that those households have earned. And then the households can use that income to purchase goods and services. And that, folks, is what we call the circular flow model. And be, what we notice is that the money and the factors of production all stay in this cycle. They get used over and over and over again. And this is how our economy keeps moving around. Okay? You may want to stop for a moment and take a nice detailed look at this picture. Um, there's also a very good version of this chart in your textbook, which helps, I think, make a nice explanation. Now, what I want to do is this. I'd like to do a little summary, okay? What we're gonna do is practice. Decide if each of these statements is true or false. And if it's false, make a change to it to, to uh, see if it's true. Okay, I'm gonna put each statement up. You may wanna stop for just a moment, try it yourself, and see what we have. Here are our four statements. Okay, go ahead and stop your the movie for a second and see if you decide that each of these statements are true or false. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to do that now. Let's take a look. The first one says households sell goods in the product market. Let's see, households sell goods in the product market. It turns out that's not true. Who sells goods in the product market? That would be the firms sell the goods in the product market. Okay, number two, firms buy resources in the factor market. 
Let's see, firms need resources, so yes, they buy those in the factor market. In particular, we think of them buying labor from households in the factor market, so that's true. Number three, firms sell goods in the factor market. Uh, nope, that's not true. Firms sell goods in the product market. Remember, households sell labor in the factor market. Firms sell goods in the product market, so that's false. And then number four, households sell resources in the factor market. That's true. The resource they usually, we think of them selling as labor. Okay, so here's a summary of our answers. Number one and number three were false. Number two and number four were true. One last question. Why do you suppose savings is considered leakage in the circular flow model? Leakage. Leakage sounds like something that accidentally spills out. Stop and think about it for a second. And then when you're ready, pause it. And then after you've done, done thinking about it, hit play again and I'll give you your answer. Okay, so why do we think savings is called leakage? Well, the best answer for that is to go back to the circular flow model for just a second. So we're going to do that for just a moment. Remember what it looks like. Here's our circular flow. You notice that everything stays in a constant loop. So the question is, why do we call savings leakage? Because what's the only way to get money out of this loop? Essentially, to not spend it. Either to not spend it on goods and services, or to not spend it on factors of production. Either way, if the money is saved, it leaks out of the circular flow model. Okay, please complete the accompanying activities from uh, Lesson 11.